in October of 2020, Bitcoin was like uh, 12,000. NASDAQ was, 11, I think Bitcoin is 12,800 or something, or maybe 11,800. And NASDAQ was like 11,000 and change. And gold was higher than it is now. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you roll the clock forward 24 months, Bitcoin is up by not quite a factor of three, but a factor of 2.75. Gold is down. NASDAQ is sideways. And, uh, and the rest is sound and fury. If you look back four years, you see the same pattern. You look back eight years, you see the same pattern. So if you're a trader, you know, you're, you go through this perverse thing of, oh, they're going to raise interest rates 75 basis points or 50 basis points, or they, did, they said they wouldn't raise it. When they weren't going to raise interest rates 75 basis points, the market rallies. When inflation is worse than you expected, the market tanks. But if inflation is worse than you expected, you really ought to be buying the inflation hedge, which is Bitcoin. Hello and welcome to Money Talks. In today's video, American entrepreneur, executive, and the chairman and CEO of MicroStrategy, Michael Saylor, shares his macro analysis on the recent volatility and price action of Bitcoin, differences between a digital security and a digital property, markets performance amid high inflationary pressures, and his thoughts on the most recent Luna and Terra crash. Make sure to stick around till the end of this video where Michael Saylor reveals the key reasons why everyone should buy the Bitcoin dip. So without wasting any time, let's dive right into the video. I, I think that this is second, first order, second derivative type stuff. Um, we're still in an inflationary environment and they're not really tightening uh, to the extent they need to, to stop that. Like uh, the theoretical interest rate you would tighten to, to stop eight and a half percent true inflation is 9%. Right, so if this was Paul Volcker, he would have raised interest rates overnight to 9%. And what we did is we raised interest rates 25 basis points or to 0.75% to and talked about maybe moving it up another 1% or 2%. So in a year and a half, when the interest rate is 2.5%, it will still be less than 8.5%. And eight and a half percent is a hedonically adjusted number. And I think I saw some calculations. They said if they used the 1980 methodology, it would have been 15%. Mm -hmm. It would have been double or something. So the, uh, the neutral interest rate, if you actually had a conservative uh, bank, would be 16% interest rate in the U.S. dollar. We're not there. We're not getting there. We're not going anywhere near there. Uh, and every prescription I've seen is is inflationary. So I think that uh, they're they're making a lot of noise. Uh, it means the traders are trading. But let's uh, and and uh, you know like minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, you have you kind of have to reduce your IQ by 50 points. <laughs> like you can't be too smart because you have to kind of, you know, dumb yourself down to trade with traders. This is why I don't trade with traders because, because the opposite of the rational is the profitable, or you have to do the double opposite of the rational to trade with traders. So I don't think that makes sense. Michael Saylor is also weighing in on the future of crypto a week after one stablecoin collapsed and sent ripples through the industry. Saylor says digital assets can be broken down into three distinct categories. The crypto crash has illustrated that the entire crypto world consists of three things. One perfect thing, which is Bitcoin and it is digital property. A few imperfect things, they're stablecoins. The world wants digital dollars. It's just hard to find them. They're looking like opaque money market funds. Then there's a multitude, a whole host of dangerous things. Altcoins are unregistered securities. And what we saw this week was an altcoin blow up. The world wants stablecoins they can trust. I think the big lesson is that all of these cryptos, other than Bitcoin, are securities. And uh, if they're securities, that means that there are management teams and there are policies. And the question is, what's, what's the reserve backing the coin? 
and what are the policies back in the coin, right? And so I can't really tell you what the reserves were or are with UST, and I can't tell you what the policies were, right? Because there aren't 200 pages of SEC filings that explain to you that, right? No one in the world knows what the, back, what the, the um, reserves are for uh, Tether. You know, you kind of have a vague idea, but you don't really know. And what are the policies? You don't really know. You know a little bit more, but you, st you still don't really know what are the reserves of the other stable coins. So the whole, the whole point of, um, of the regulators like Gary Gensler is their securities, uh, there should be full disclosures. The disclosures require armies of lawyers and accountants, right? They slow things down. You know, you can't go fast and break things when you're dealing with that much money. You have to actually disclose everything. And uh, people ought to know what they're investing in. So if you, if you buy MicroStrategy stock, you can read, you can read all of our bond terms. They're published. We, pub you know, we publish the terms uh, of the Silvergate loan, the terms of the converts, the terms of the junk bond. You can read them, right? You can read the financial statements of the company. You can read about who governs the company, right? You know who the shareholders of the company are. You know every single time any material thing changes, right, via an 8K. That's the way that, uh, that securities work when you're, when you're um, responsible for large sums of, uh, of other people's money. I think that uh, the crypto industry is immature. It's going to grow up, right? And it needs to, we're crossing the chasm from entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial uh, driven uh, entities to institutional entities. And one thing that institutions do is, is they have uh, very sophisticated systems for providing transparency, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and they have like three attorneys to figure out when you write the sentence saying exactly who does what, when, how do you punctuate it? And did you, and is there any confusion? If there is some confusion, that's a problem. That's why people obsess over these things, right? It's, and you can see. Even when you make, if you make adequate or full disclosures with a thousand pages of, of text, people will still get confused either intentionally or unintentionally, right? So if you don't make all those disclosures, then I think what you have is chaos. And, uh, and I think that's the lesson from this. I think, I think it's time for the industry to grow up. And I think it's time for people to figure out the difference between uh, a security token and a digital property. In the wake of the algorithmic Terra USD depegging from the US dollar and the affiliated altcoin Terra Luna crumbling to cause price losses of over 99%, the MicroStrategy founder believes that the long term fallout will be positive for both Bitcoin while speeding up the regulation process. I think this entire crypto crash is going to be great for Bitcoin. It's going to accelerate some much-needed regulation of stablecoins, altcoins, and the exchanges. It's eliminating the political deadlock. It's educating the world in the difference between Bitcoin and security tokens. And that's going to facilitate the entry of institutions into this space. The Bitcoin bull says that in addition to winning over industry capital, everyday people are drawn to crypto as an alternative way of investing their money separate from the stock market. I think every week we're making new converts. We're running over the big banks and we're winning over the fidelities. People realize this is a good idea and the basic idea is that billions of people on the planet shouldn't have to gamble their life savings in a stock market or some casino in order to avoid losing all their money. So why not invest in a hard, hard money? Maybe the hardest money the human race has ever invented called Bitcoin and just wait. From a, a macro point of view, the, whole, the only thing that really matters is how much Bitcoin do you have? At the end of the day, you're buying one twenty-one millionth of all the energy in the network forever. And so if you keep accreting your Bitcoin, then you're getting a greater share of the energy in the network forever. And, and the network is getting more powerful as people learn more. So the macroeconomic strategy is straightforward. Mm -hmm. The corporate strategy is also straightforward, which is we're a publicly traded company with a security and someone buying our security is buying it because they want to be long Bitcoin exposure. 
So if I had a million dollars and I wanted to buy Bitcoin, but I can't buy the Bitcoin, like, like a lot of people can't buy the underlying property either for legal reasons or tax reasons or technical reasons or charter reasons. There are a lot of reasons why they can't buy Bitcoin directly. Mm -hmm. So they have to buy a security. So when they buy a security, their choice is to buy an ETF, either buy BTO or they buy G uh, GBTC or they buy a Bitcoin miner, or they buy MicroStrategy. And, yep. and they all have different characteristics, but MicroStrategy looks more like um, a, a levered spot Bitcoin uh, mm -hmm. holder, and, and we're paying yield instead of charging you a fee. Right. Right, like if you were to put a billion dollars in a fund that charged you 2.5% fee, you pay $25 million a year. If you put it into a futures product that has a 10 or 12% rollover cost, you're going to pay $125 million a year to have the billion dollars invested. Mm -hmm. If you put it in micro strategy, we're not charging you a fee. We're not rolling over futures and we're levered to the upside. And you're getting a yield and it's tax free. And the last point I make is that um, if the currency is collapsing, then you need negative working capital. You need negative net working capital. So uh, if you have a billion dollars in pesos and the peso is losing 50% of its value a year, then it's costing you $500 million to hold a billion dollars in peso working capital. When you flip the billion dollars into USD, you're losing 200 million a year to hold that as working capital because that's the M2 money expansion rate. So if you didn't have Bitcoin, I mean, the, the ideal thing is buy a billion in Bitcoin and hold it. But if you couldn't do that, what you would do is you would buy back your stock with the billion dollars, or you would borrow two or three billion. Right? You don't want to be plus a billion. You want to be you want to owe two billion. So you would borrow two billion dollars and or three billion in pesos. And so instead of actually losing five hundred million a year by having positive working capital you would make the equivalent of 500 million a year by having negative working capital. Mm -hmm. so, so leverage for a retail trader means maybe you're going to get forced liquidated when, when the, the asset trades up or down. That's a bad idea. But um, debt for a corporation is almost essential. It's almost essential uh, if you're in a, um, in a inflationary currency regime. So do you agree with Michael Saylor that all other digital securities will eventually collapse like Terra Luna? Tell us in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon with the next video. Thank you so much for watching.